Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger. And this is episode number 416. That's 416 of the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking and caring about me. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below and turn on the notification bell so you can be notified for all my updates. You know, the good old stuff, you know, the casual, normal stuff. Do that and we're square, we're safe, me and you, we're cool, all right? And of course, all my links to my socials you can find as well in the description box. Make sure you click on there, follow me on there, give me a message, say what's up, let me know your thoughts on the show. All of that is greatly appreciated. Oof. Here we are, man. And, um, what last day or two of the year? Hope you are well. Hope you are fed, fine, hydrated, all that malarkey, nice and limbered up. Um, yeah. How was your Christmas? I guess since I've last checked in, I think I did a podcast on Christmas Eve. So I guess how's your Christmas break? Did you get anything nice? Did you get any cool gifts? Were you surrounded by love and light and happiness, or were you like everybody else in the world, just dreading the year to come? <laughs> like you've never dreaded a year. This might be the only year. Hmm. This might be the only time in history, the only time in my recent history where I can remember everyone collectively being a little bit down about the year to come. Usually there's always that person in your group that's like the cynic, um, that's like the Debbie Downer, who's always got something negative to say, who's always kind of bringing the mood down. You will kind of have to pick them up and, you know, um, put a positive spin on it and maybe see them, let them, you know, maybe... um throw out throw out something to allow them to see it through another way bloody blah, blah 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 but the way COVID has affected us <laughs> as humans you know the world over you would you would be you would be within your rights to kind of remain a little bit pessimistic about the future especially considering this new variant strain that we have here at the moment right we have what three strains now right at the moment circulating the world <laughs> and there's another i think does that include the african strain that they found in south africa or something like that like regardless the strain that we started off with has now mutated into this other thing that is now more transmissible but somehow is still um you know can still get eradicated in some way shape or form by the vaccine which i'm not really sold on but hey if the scientists say so do you have to just go with it but that seems a bit fishy like imagine just imagine like this is one of the most it's <sighs> I guess there's something to be said for it being also an opportunity to really look at what you've done this year and sort of make some necessary changes for the next because what I've what I've sort of realized especially from reading the news and probably reading too much news and keep up to date what's going around the world more second than not even your most you know optimistic uh forecaster is basically saying we're going to be in the shit for another year right um I'm reading articles now that's telling, you know, if we're not, the only way to get out of the shit is for us all get vaccinated, but they're going to have to vaccinate, what, two mil a, a week, and we just haven't got the capacity, not the stock to do that, and obviously there's the compliance issue too, you're going to need 90% of the public to get vaccinated two mil a week on a regular basis, which is, you know, now an impossible to achieve, even with what's at stake at the moment, so if that's the case, then you're, you're really going to need to um somewhat condition and toughen your mind and your spirit um for the next year or so to come you're really gonna have to do that regardless of how shit you must feel about it. you're gonna have to just it's 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 more than stiff up a lip you're gonna have to really fortify your mind and uh, everything around it um your soul your spirit like i said to just withstand another year of quite um another year of even worse second oh yeah another year of probably uh, more pain because I think the first year was a little bit easier to deal with because it was all novel it was all new we didn't really know what we were going through we were all kind of making mistakes all uh, I'd say all of us but you know let's say we're all making mistakes together right um as a global community now that we've kind of settled into this and we know what the deal is we know how to do we know we've seen evidence of countries who have dealt with COVID better dealt with COVID better than others. We've seen, um, you know, obviously displays of leadership from some countries and, and not so much from others. We've now got an idea and perspective of what's going on. It's going to hurt a lot more in the new year if we're seeing other countries thriving and opening up whilst we're still kind of stuck in this sort of weird um, COVID purgatory where we're sort of open but sort of closed, you know? People are not going to have it and um, people are just going to be suffering in general. So if ever there was a time to write down a... Um, New Year's resolution 
to stick be, stick by and to somehow distract you from the horrors of day-to-day -day life this would be it like again i'm not really one to give people rah rah motivational messages because that's not really my thing i do it for myself i listen to that stuff on my own on my own time right i'm a big gary v advocate i love tim ferris all those kind of dudes but i don't try and talk about a lot of that stuff on here because you know again who am i to tell anyone to do anything but if ever there was a time for that sort of you know motivational um you know goal setting journaling meditation working out whatever idea about life this would be it especially if you don't have anything right if you've just if you're just broke and you're just living day to day and hoping that you wake up the next morning the least you can do is give yourself some sort of framework that you can sort of work within um especially considering that we're going to be in a shit for another year or so um that would just make sense the last thing you want is to be holding on for hope that the government's gonna kind of pull you out of it like i think we've all kind of come to realization during this year that more than you know uh we've all come to realization i think this year more so than any other year that you know the gap between the rich and the poor isn't mostly monetary monetary it's more so options it's more so um freedom of movement right how many people of of means have you seen on your timeline being able to go and holiday all year round celebrate birthdays eat at great restaurants even during this pandemic or epidemic right they've still been able to sort of maneuver and do what they have, they would have done last year with no real with no real change to their overall um overall what do you call it but the overall quality of life that hasn't really been affected whereas you and i our quality of life definitely has been affected right you have to maybe sacrifice some stuff you probably dumped this one you might got let go from a job you might have not seen your friends in a while like every part of your life has sort of been affected in some way shape or form right and it sort of made you realize it should have made you realize that wow man like this is why having um wealth or being like what's that word what, what those people call their fear right um financially independent financial independence right that that sort of group of people um that's why it's so important to have it like financial independence and not be able not be kind of uh beholden to the whims of the market in some way shape or form right or not beholden to the you know to the whims of the world in, in other way shape or form especially if you've got a family imagine if you've got a family and you're like the main breadwinner and you've been let go now what you know what I mean? It's just like there's so many mad scenarios that are out there that are sort of like playing themselves out. And it seems like for the most part, no one really gives a crap because everyone's going through their own little internal hell. You don't really have time to worry about what your neighbor's going through, right? Because you're struggling yourself day to day. So um, if that's the case, then the, re the best you can do for yourself and your family and those people close to you is to really write down some goals and some renewed resolutions about what you want to do I, I know i'm going to do that and i'm going to share it in the next podcast i'll let you guys know what i'm going to be doing but i've got i've got like a half of it already specked out some stuff i want to do some obviously fitness goals some mind mindfulness goals some overall financial goals and stuff i've got in place because um if we keep going on the way we're going on now for sure like if this is the same route we're going to be following until the new year i don't see this changing for a while no way like it's just unlikely you know we keep making the same mistakes you know we keep locking down not really adequately testing um not really staying in place adequately mistakes keep getting made maybe certain segments sectors of the of the of the industry of the world or our economy should be closed should be open there's so many missteps here and there that i just don't think you can just fix that overnight I think you kind of always pay the price for the mistakes you've made. I'm kind of a believer of that. You kind of have to kind of, you have to let it play out. You can't just like, you know, you make a mistake or you make an error or you do somebody dirty. You can't just um, cancel it by doing two good deeds. You have to sort of, you know, play out whatever nonsense you got up to. So I think this is what's happening at the moment now. Every sort of bad move we made in the beginning of this is we're sort of paying dividends or it's sort of coming back to kick us in the bum towards the end of the year, which is, you know, um, it's a bitter pill to swallow. It hurts a lot more when your balls are cold in during the winter. Um, but hey, it is what it is. Situation we're in, you have to make the best out of it. So, like I said, New Year's, New Year's resolutions. Try and get as much of those down as you can. Um, fortify your mind, body, and spirit as best you can because we're gonna be in this mare for another year or so at the very least. That's my opinion. Talking about being in a mare. And talking about being in a very precarious position and talking about maybe having some gratitude for where you are and where you might um, be living at the moment 
there's this crazy article here from the South China Morning Post about a um, China jails a citizen journalist Zhang Zhang Zan Zhang Zan do I pronounce the name Zhang Zan for f- uh, four years over Wuhan coronavirus reports. Like imagine a journalist in China is getting jailed for covering the coronavirus um, in Wuhan. Like absolutely insane, right? So let's scroll down here. Oh, it's got an autoplay as per usual. Let's pause this. Cool. Actually, need to plug this in. Okay, so it says the following. Um, citizen journalist Zhang Zan has, was sentenced to four years in prison in Shanghai on Monday for her reporting of the coronavirus pandemic in central Chinese city of Wuhan earlier this year, one of her lawyers said. Zhang, 37, was found guilty by Shanghai Pongdun um, New Area Police or People's Court on Monday morning for pickle, for picking quarrels and provoking trouble, a broadly defined offence which carries a maximum sentence of five years and is often used by police to stifle dissent. Zhang Zhan attended the trial in a wheelchair and was in poor health for lawyers. I think she's on hunger strike. She did not um, immediately say if she would appeal the sentence. Um, on social media after the trial, Zhang Keki said during the trial, the prosecutors only read out a list of evidence without showing most of it, including the court evidence. Zhang Zhang says citizens' um, speech should not be censored. But apart from that, she basically did not speak. Zhang Zhan, who has been uh, held in a detention center in Pongdun district in Shanghai since mid-May, has maintained her innocence and in June, she started refusing to take food to protest against her arrest, legal sources said. She is one of the few citizen journalists in China to report on the early experience of the people in Wuhan during the city's lockdown. Uh, the others have either been detained or ordered to stop their online reporting. In front of the Pondong court, dozens of people who came from all over the country to support Zhang Zhang were driven away way by police according to their witnesses um lai dai we lai dai way is that how you it lai dai way or lai dai we i don't know if i pronounce her name um apologies there 58 a rights activist and former police officer from gansu province um said he took the train to shanghai to show support he said he arrived at the court at 9 a.m officer didn't turn to the courtroom to observe the trial but was stopped by police he said he argued with police asserting that the charge against saying was open was only provoking trouble which did not involve uh, state secrets or, pro- or personal privacy and questioned why as a public trial citizens should not walk in this and listen Lai um, said police told him he should have applied to the judge in advance, but Lai said he this violated his freedom of citizens to observe an open court case. After the argument, Lai was taken to the police station and was released at around 1 p.m. He said, I have not met Zhang Zhan, he said. He just chatted with her on social media, and after knowing that she went to Wuhan alone, I was very worried. God damn it. Look at the police facing off with, I guess, journalist outside of the courtroom, not giving an absolute toss. He said, we kept in touch until she was arrested, knowing that she was on the hunger strike. Made me even anxious. I have to support her. I was sacked. I was shocked by the sentence. She should be released right now and get treatment. The Wuhan resident who would only identify herself as whatever that, how you pronounce that word is, traveled from Wuhan to Shanghai on Sunday. He had met Zhang Zhan in the central Chinese city in April. He said... Or well, this person said, we were full of fears about the virus and the future during the Wuhan lockdown. So we thanked Zhang for arriving in Wuhan. So brave. And I heard that she bought a train ticket to Choing, uh, what's that? Chongqing, Chongqing, right? and got off in Wuhan alone. Um, she said that she also tried to enter the court to observe the trial and was obs- and refused by police who told her she should not go in because of epidemic um, prevention <coughs> and control measures in place. Zhang Zhang is the only one paying the biggest price in Wuhan, a price of blood and tears of health and life. Zhang Zhang is unbelievably determined for the truth and faith. As a Wuhan native, I must support her, he said. God almighty. Just imagine, man. This regime stands on two pillars, lies and power. It covers up the truth about the pandemic with lies and it can carry on its rule and uses the power of the, to intimidate the shut up and ordinary people and heavy sentences to punish people who are not afraid of the intimidation crazy isn't it? and this is what you would assume real journalism looks like right putting yourself in harm's way in or in pursuit of the truth in order to inf- inform your fellow citizens in order to speak truth to power in the truest sense of the word not to take down random hollywood elites because you want their jobs right this is what journalism actually looks like and look what she's doing she's legitimately maybe potentially hopefully not having to she's paying with it with her life 
She's in prison now for five to six years simply for covering the coronavirus in Wuhan, a place where it originally, where it basically originated from. Absolutely insane. And for the most part, they're not saying that she she's reporting not in the same way, you know, the whistleblower reported in the beginning who unfortunately passed away to RIP, that gentleman. She's just reporting in a way of like, hey, we need to report this fairly and accurately so we don't paint a picture that isn't incorrect to the world. That's all she was doing. She wasn't being, you know, conniving. She wasn't trying to bring down the Chinese government, um, you know, inside out by, you know, co-opting some PSYOP measures from, you know, I don't know, from the Western world. She was a, she was simply trying to inform people who she, you know, calls her, you know, her brothers and sisters of the horrors that are going on there in Wuhan at the moment. And essentially, she's legitimately maybe have to pay with her life with it. Absolutely shocking. So again, it goes to show, man, like, as terrible as it can be for us here in the West, <clears throat> in terms of the ineptitude and how they've been dealing with COVID, we have to be really thankful that we don't live in sh you know, China at the moment. Yes, there are some benefits to living under such regime because, you know, essentially they've been able to have a better handle on COVID due to the fact that they can essentially impose lockdown measures, order people to stay in place, deploy the army on the streets, basically have people knocking on people's door and making sure they're inside, taping them indoors with caution tape or surveillance 24-7, DNA, blood samples, that crazy, crazy amount of shit, right, that they can get away with that obviously we can't get away with here in the West, which has an advantage because, of course, um, for the most part, and the fact that they rely on so much international trade, there is an incentive on their heart, on their side to make sure they can eradicate COVID as close as possible as they can, get a functioning vaccine to work so they can reopen the economy and re-welcome re re the international, you know, customers that they know and love. But on the other side of it, if you fall on their bad side, if you happen to speak out of turn, if you happen to maybe shine light on something you're not meant to shine light on, your life could be over very, very quickly. Or your life could be completely changed very, very quickly. Like absolutely mad, man. So yeah, so free Zhang, free, um, sorry, free Zhang Zan. Um, four years for reporting the truth about COVID in China. Absolute travesty. Hopefully she appeals it and somehow they come to a sensible decision and free her before this becomes one of those like, you know, horrible stories that you hear later on down the line with a really tragic ending. We don't want that to happen, of course. You know, we already have enough bad news as it is with COVID. The last thing you need is for, you know, Chinese journalists who are basically trying to help their local citizens or fellow citizens being jailed for reporting the truth of an issue. On the other end of the things, we've got this pretty interesting article here from Bloomberg um, talking about my usually normal, unusually normal life in Taiwan amid a global pandemic. As the world went into meltdown, life has been good um, in the happy little bubble that is Taiwan by a guy called Tim Colpen. It's a pretty cool article. Um, he essentially describes his time, um, you know, um, two stages of his life or two stages two visits to Taiwan recently during the beginning of COVID, obviously during the end um, or during the end of the year, start of the year and end of the year. And it kind of contrasts how differently they've been dealing with COVID in Taiwan. And um, it just kind of goes to echo that there are good there are good examples of countries that have been able to deal with COVID in a much more effective way than we have here in the West. And as much as they like to tell us, oh, we can't use them as an example, we should be using some of the lessons, some of the learnings, some of the good things and be applying them where applicable um, to how we're dealing with things. Because so far our approach just simply isn't working. Um, and I don't see what we have to lose really. Um, we don't really have anything to lose, in my opinion. I think we should just go for it in general, but hey, what do I know? So this is an article here, it says, um, I was at Hong Kong International Airport um, the morning the U.S. reported its first case of a virus in Wuhan, China. News had already been circulating about the deadly news and illness in Taiwan, my point of departure, and I spent a layover rushing around looking for pr provisions needed to minimize the risk of my flight to New York. As you can see, it's spanning it out. Mask were out of stock, but I eventually found a small bottle of sanitizer um, with a cartoon Shiba Una dog on a label. An irony I had later appreciate. At the airline lounge, staff were dismissive of my suggestion that the hand sanitizer be be made available um, on the counter to all passengers i knew that that would change of course it's a, it's a bit of a journalist and you know, so he's, he's already kind of um you know sucking himself off but you kind of get the gist of it and then it comes here da, da, da. where's the bit where it comes gets juicy it's here here 10 months entirely um 
10 months and an eternity later, we all know how wrong that was. It says, while cities in New York and to London and Melbourne went into the shutdown, the entirety of Taiwan stayed open for business. In the past few months, I've joined music festivals, marathons, swam in public pools and worked out at a fully functioning gymnasium, had drinks at packed bars and attended banquet dinners not one but two pride parades were held this year in taipei while the same event was cancelled at almost every other city around the world yeah that's one thing you didn't see at all no um no pride events anywhere anywhere i don't think for the most part who got away with one did canada get away with one did they sneak one in properly no i don't think we saw anything right so imagine how foreign that sounds it's like when at the moment now you know because my algorithm's all messed up on youtube because i've been liking loads of um old clips of raves and festivals so i'm getting recommended all these mad things you know that's essentially um making me have wanderlust and a bit of fomo it's not really fomo because you're never going to be there but in general right it's just trying to you're basically remembering a time when people were you know able to frolic and dance and you know uh just be happy and outside in densely packed places next to each other body to body skin to skin saliva to saliva and it feels so foreign so when somebody's describing this happening now you know as we're living you know in a completely different part of the world it just makes you think flipping hell like why aren't our government seeing what they're doing and trying to apply whatever lessons they can to what we're doing and approaching here in the uk why isn't that happening like is it an arrogance thing is it just a lack of wanting to try i wonder why it is it's because you know who wouldn't want to be going to a banquet dinner just because who wouldn't want to be going to a fully functioning gymnasium right who wouldn't want to do that just now like oh yeah yeah and it continues to put it bluntly life in taiwan this year has been radically ridiculously normal in the weekend before christmas hotel ballrooms were busy with weddings and while i joined friends at an annual dinner that ended at a crowded nightclub where party goes mask off and smiles on dance a uh, cheek by jowl this one thing i'm interested in, i've not heard anybody in djs talk about this though i've not heard anyone say anything um about going to play in Taiwan because usually you can follow the route of all the, you know, because I think I posted on Twitter the other day, <clears throat> out of the top 10 places that have the highest amount of death relate, deaths related to COVID, seven of them are, were like the key spots everyone went to DJ during the summer. They were the, all the hotspots, right? The Spains, the Frances, um, the Mexicos, a few other places, right? Those were the places they ever went to go DJ. So whenever, if you want to kind of have an idea on places that are open or, you know, that are kind of back to some sort of level of normality or places where essentially the government are kind of ignoring all kind of, you know, um, scientific um, reasoning and caution to deal with COVID and just willing to open up the floodgates in order to kind of bring in more tourists to kind of amp up the money. Look at a DJ's guest, look at a DJ's um, booking list. You have to check it out pretty quickly. It continues here. I'm writing this on a laptop in a busy Taipei cafe, one of dozens doing well amid the pandemic. I'm a group of friends sitting nearby chatting um, and uh animatedly yeah, animatedly um the only sign of a pandemic being their tail covid okay the their total covid collars and cuffs masks kept around the neck or wrists were not covering their face bar and restaurant owners have told me that after a slow start in march april um, traffic started to pick up over the summer with some even posting record monthly revenue wow flights to offshore islands were sold out throughout the middle of the year and accommodation was hard to find top operators and five-star hotels um, haven't been so lucky losing out on international travelers that sustained their business so this is probably a good um, evidence or a good kind of um prime no, this is basically a good sort of example of maybe what will happen once we get back to normal i i predict the same sort of things happen here in the uk right you see bars and restaurants essentially struggle the first couple of months when things do reopen because people are still scared and kind of pull off back going to crowded places then as soon as that kind of fear wears off they're going to spike and go completely nuts especially here in london right where everyone essentially hangs out in bars and restaurants for the most part flights to offshore islands again i guess if there's some sort of concerted approach between you know the uk even though we're at the europe to somehow have some sort of joint effort in order to kind of combat corona i could definitely see people deciding hey i'm going to fly out to you know various places in europe to have a quick holiday but i can definitely see a lot of um 
a lot of boom in different sectors of the economy once life gets back to normal kind of you know mirroring what's happening in taiwan for sure it continues the 2020 tokyo olympics the world ironman championship in hawaii and the famed boston marathon add to a long list of global sporting events that have been cancelled by contrast more than 1,500 triathletes competed in the south pingtung county this december and almost 30,000 joined the taipei city marathon they had a marathon in taipei amazing as friends and family colleagues around the world um tore their hair out over the stop start school programs that have disrupted children's education and mental health the taiwanese classes continued as normal students would graduate on time with lavish celebrations myself and fellow taiwan residents often discuss the mixed emotions of watching the world go out in there go go the world out there go into a meltdown while we enjoy life here in our happy little bubble Pride is tempered by a sense of survivor's guilt, as if this success was our personal doing, when in reality the most savvy thing that we did was choosing to stay put. Less than 10 lives have been lost for from fewer than 800 cases. Wow. Almost 90% of those patients being um, brought the virus from overseas and were discovered through tests and borders or in quarantine. While the economy isn't immune, Taipei's GDP will be one of those few of the year to post growth with the expectation of 2.5% expansion. So yeah, I can definitely understand that survivor's guilt in it. That feeling that, you know, because that's the one thing that's been interesting to see from the elites and people that have been able to have you know the means to go abroad you don't really get a sense that they're i wouldn't say it's a shame thing but there will be a little bit of an embarrassment to feel as if like you know the fact that you're able to kind of go on these lavish holidays aspen dubai yeah mexico um parts of central america south america it should be a little bit embarrassing to the i don't know i would feel a little bit embarrassed just because you know you're able to do it you might post one or two clips here and there but to you know film an entire to have an entire editorial photo shoot spread done in your instagram documenting your every step of your journey um and sort of kind of allowing your fans to you know live the experience through your social media feed just comes across a bit disingenuous and a little bit um tone deaf to what's going on in the world that's all that's the kind of thing so i think if somebody in Taiwan that's just a regular person, right, a regular normie, feels guilty that they are enjoying friend, enjoying drinks with friends in a bar, um, that they're able to go and run a marathon in a city center, why don't, you know, your run-of-the-mill influencers who are all going to the same seven locations around the world feel an adequate amount of shame too that they're posting all these things on their social media feed while essentially the world is on fire? Why is that? Are they that self-absorbed? <laughs> Are they that um, clueless as to the pains and the trials of everyone else around them? Because it always surprises me that sort of approach because I think to myself, like, the majority of their fans are definitely normies the majority of their fans are definitely people that have nine to fives right regular people they're not essentially being followed by other influencers i would assume right some influencers i guess do keep an eye on what's going on to kind of you know get abreast on the new styles and new trends blah 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 but assume the majority of these people's audiences are made up of people like you and i yet they're, they're trying to what sort i don't know f uh stunt on us like we know we know you're rich we know you're richer than us at the moment as well because what we're following you we're sort of trying to live vicariously see through you but if there ever was a time to be a bit more tactful and kind of you know not be so um ostentatious with your wealth and you know putting it all out there i think this will be the time just me personally i don't know maybe other people are different and it provides them yeah maybe some people are like no nah, actually actually you know you're, you're making it you're seeing it the wrong way it actually provides a good bit of respite or respite sorry in terms of and a, or a bit of escape escapism right in terms of be able to sort of like you know live live it through their pictures blah 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 but i don't know it just always rubbed me up the wrong way so the fact that these you know regular people living in taiwan are feeling a little bit of a survivor's guilt for just having a drink with some friends in a restaurant i think it definitely goes to um certify the point that i'm trying to make there um but yeah it's a pretty interesting article i recommend you check it out um it's a bit of a long i'm not gonna read the entire thing i'll link it to show to you guys to read it it's called my unusually normal life in taiwan amid the global pandemic um it's written by tim colpan i'll post the link in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself but it's very very interesting i enjoyed reading it what else we have here Da, 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 da. we have this article from the guardian it says covid poses the greatest threat to mental health since the second world war well duh isn't it that's not really a big that's not really big news um again 
what work is being done to combat this and to help people i don't really know again i'm not really involved in that field um i don't really have to see anybody for any sort of mental health issues that i may or may not have had in the past or i'm currently going through but i can only imagine what people who already suffered from mental health issues prior to covid um especially existential dread sort of stuff right especially stuff yeah like i can just imagine this being exasperated more so during this crazy time especially when maybe access to professionals isn't that readily available and just the essential um just it, it, in general as well the kind of afterthought that mental health is sort of treated with in general i can imagine it being a big big issue for most people and again i don't think we're going to see the effects of such things until what two three four five years later down the line we're going to see the after after effects like we've lost many people right um to unfortunately mental health issues um during this year right just in the dance music scene alone i know of at least four people who have unfortunately passed away just through varying amounts of things but in generally what essentially has been boiled down to is that their entire person their entire um, identity has been stripped away from them and you know they don't see any way back they don't see what else they have to live for um if that's part of their life is gone and it's a very important part of, as kind of you know into um into consequential as it can appear to some people it is really important to others right do you know what i mean whatever they do you know it doesn't matter if you just go skateboard with your friends on the weekend like there are a lot of things that are being affected by covid that don't necessarily have to do with just you having a job it's just kind of your day-to-day -day, the things that kind of give you a reason to live um especially in the in a time where we're living in a world where most people don't really have um an inner compass right we're not really an overly religious um yeah in the west especially we're not really a religious people anymore right we've sort of kind of abandoned god for the sake of reason and science and now we're kind of you know um we're sort of kind of we're now in a position where people are doubting reason and science because they've led us as you should at the moment right we're sort of kind of in this weird weird spot um so you can only imagine what people are suffering through so again thoughts and prayers go out to anybody who's really struggling at the moment um if you can talk to somebody i guess you should do it if you cannot then i'm hoping you've got friends and family around you that can help um and sort of kind of be able to give you assistance during this dark time but i would also kind of tell you that just hold on man brighter brighter days are coming brighter days are coming it, it seems bleak at the moment it doesn't seem like there's going to be any light in the tunnel it seems like um every time you turn on the tv or you go on your social media feed everything's on fire but i promise you things will get better um in due course you just have to hang on you just have to hang on a couple you know months years more and i promise you things will get better but you just have to hold on until then <laughs> Um, then we have this really, really interesting article here from the Guardian War um, in terms of topic um, regarding schools reopening. So at the moment with COVID, we've got this really, I guess most places are the same, right? Because transmission rates with secondary school kids would, you know, be the same, I guess, with it being gay viruses affecting everybody. But in general, the kind of general thinking behind it is that there's a thinking or there's a theory, not theory, there's evidence that out there that suggests that the biggest spreaders of COVID at the moment our kids in secondary school right the ages between 11 and 16 years old because they tend to come in contact with a uh, larger group of pool of people than you or i right we can probably stay in place a lot easier but if you're a kid and you go to school and you're dinner ladies of a certain age you're touching her if you've got it and you don't know you have it because you're anti-Semitic, and then she's passing it on blah, blah 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 you know the deal so there is an argument to be had out there for closing schools entirely until we get the r number to a certain level and then reopening it in a staggered level in a staggered sort of way um or kind of revert into um remote learning by the beginning of the pandemic there was a real sort of uh, pushback against that because i guess a lot of you know it sort of this whole virus has exposed many many things right there's that saying about um what's 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 um what's done in the dark will always come to light this is basically what's happened right all of our little dirty secrets all the things that we kind of were purposely putting our head in the sand with in regards to like poverty in regards to inequality have essentially come you know out uh in the biggest way possible right they're shining underneath a uv light for the most part no pun intended and basically what we've seen is that the you know the education the system in the uk is 
grossly inadequate in terms of dealing with the large amounts of people learning remotely. Um, we have, you know, children and families who don't have access to computers or to any, you know, systems or something that would allow their kids to learn adequately in that regard. Some kids also don't have the space and the room in order to learn, you know, at that level. Some kids are also just not being uh, taught well enough in school that would allow them to learn on their own, um, unassisted in some way, shape or form in that regard as well. So there's so many issues that are going on at the moment that are affecting um, the government's ability to say hey cool let's just close the schools that the easiest option for them to do was just to keep them open because it essentially was one less problem off their table um, but of course you know it sort of reared his head again with Marcus Rashford pushing for the free school meals and all the double double u-turns but now going forward with how bleak it's looking the only option that exists now at the moment is for schools to be closed for a certain for for a period of time until things get back to normal and then they can slowly be reopened again. But if they do do it, this is going to be a um, an extreme about face kind of U turn move because there's one thing that the Tories have been hell bent on kind of reminding everybody is how important schools are to the future of that all this sort of nonsense, right? It's like, bruv, you wreck the future of our children in general anyway. Just close the schools. But anyway, what can you do? This article here from The Guardian says England school reopening in doubt with ministers divided. It says the following plans for millions of pupils in England to begin a staggered return to school from next week hang in the balance as debate rages on within the government over the risk of the surge of infection with the NHS already buckling under the strain. The Education Secretary Gavin Williamson is understood to be mounting a rearguard action against what one source described as a senior colleagues who have been alarmed by the advice that reopening schools will make it impossible to keep the R number below one. Opposition to schools reopening next week is also growing from teaching unions. Um, the UK's largest has said the reopening of schools in England should be delayed for at least two weeks um, amid mounting concerns about the new COVID strain um, spreading from London and South East. Right? Of course, that's why we're in Tier 4 at the moment with Tier 5 soon coming coming more on that later the pressure grew as nhs england said it had record of 20,426 people in hospital being treated for covid19 as of the 8 uh, 8 a.m on monday surpassing april's peak of 18,946 health officials in wales and scotland have also said that they feared uh, becoming overwhelmed you've got michael gove's annoying face there williamson's allies have been consulting mps to see if they may be publicly come out um, in favor of schools reopening at the time he's understood to be um, raising concerns about the effect on some exams in england if more learning hours are lit are uh, are lost he has previously emphasized he believes school leaders would find it difficult to reopen schools again after a short closure because of the impact of the parent and teacher confidence the department of education has said that the return to schools is kept under review so loads of things to kind of go over there that they need to kind of think about again um <laughs> The easiest choice sometimes isn't the easiest choice to make, especially when you've said categorically that you're never going to close schools. I think just the other day they threatened to sue a school in South London that went to close. But if we need any sort of, if a return to normality is on the cards, because skills will have to close and then we just have to just figure out something in it again i don't i only have sympathy for the kids i have to you know learn whatever they're learning in school in a cramped two-bedroom apartment um whilst you know in the background their parents are arguing over money because they don't know when the next meal is going to come or you know or the electricity's cut out like just crazy shit man so let's see what happens in it let's really see what happens it's not not the best solution at the moment um I think they've even got this uh, quote here that says, we found that regardless of control measures simulated, yeah, this is probably to get things back to normal, right? We found that regardless of control measures simulated, all NHS regions are projected to experience a subsequent wave of COVID-19 cases and deaths peaking in spring 2021 for London, South East and England and in summer 2021 for the rest of England. In the absence of substantial vaccine rollout, cases and hospitalization, ICU admissions and deaths in 2021 may exceed those in 2020. That's bleak, right? The most stringent intervention scenario with tier three for England wide and schools closed during January and too many individuals vaccinated per week is the only scenario we considered, which reduces the peak ICU burden below the levels seen during the first wave. And that's what I said in the beginning. You're going to need to close school for two weeks, right? 
at least or the majority of January and you're going to need to test I'm sorry vaccinate more than 2 million people per week that those numbers are just wild isn't it again you're going to need up, up to 90% of people to get vaccinated it just seems like <laughs> I don't know how they're going to do it I really don't it's going to be a Herculean effort it's going to be a Herculean effort for everybody to get this on to get this sorted and unfortunately i think we might have to come that we might be in a position where we might just have to all just say hey cool the government fucked up they made loads of mistakes but we're gonna have to step in and help them out right like we just might have to do that we might just have to like you know when like you're arguing with somebody or like a friend but they've got like a birthday coming up or something i don't know whatever right and you just you know what for the sake of their special day i'm going to put this to one side it doesn't mean i i agree or i'm condoning what they said or i'm sort of excusing their behavior but i'm just going to for the for the greater good i'm going to put it to one side and just celebrate the special day that's essentially what we're doing now at the moment oh it's like you know when you don't ask someone for you know someone's struggling to carry something and you just step in and you help out right even though that person you don't particularly like them <laughs> that's essentially what we're basically doing at the moment we're not you're not kind of tapping them on the shoulder as they're struggling with a massive subwoof and saying hey do you some help whilst we hear the bones in their back crunch crunching like you know rice krispies no instead we just go and help them out because i think this is the only way it's gonna it's gonna get solved i don't see how we can just sit back and with our arms crossed with our mask on hoping that the you know, government sort of work it out i just don't think that's gonna make any sort of sense long term that's just my opinion then we have um last bit of covid news and we move on we have this news regarding tier five so supposedly um there's another tier uh, coming soon at the moment the tier thing hasn't really worked that well in the uk for what i've seen i think we've basically kind of all agreed that it was nice that they decided to um have this regionalized approach to dealing with covid because numbers in certain areas are higher than others but i think in terms of overall compliance and in terms of that whole idea of civic duty and in terms of the fact that we all just go through this together regardless of what's going on in different the regions it would have been advantageous for us to have all been under some level of tiered lockdown right on the same level and to have been, been so, so for maybe the numbers to be yeah maybe that you could take the numbers as a median right you kind of collect all the numbers together and you sort of see what the average line is and then you decide whether or not we got up or down based on that especially when you see how badly um people in the north in places such as manchester were treated um you know vis-a-vis -vis how we were treated here in london with terms of how we were opened up and they weren't opened up or they weren't lower to a certain tier blah 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 blah. i think it would have been a lot more it would have been a fairer system to have just had us all in a tiered um you know in a in a tiered lockdown and some approach and then basically the onus would be on our local governments on us on our local officials our mayors to instruct the populace to be like hey be careful don't make it don't take unnecessary risks don't be stupid so that we can all kind of go down a level so we can kind of open up the economy i think that would have made more sense but again they keep pursuing pursuing these things more so because they don't want to um you know engage in another national lockdown which i completely understand i think it's bad pr for the toys in general and you know it's devastating for the economy and people as mental health right i've mentioned it prior but um, it seems like this is the only kind of thing that's going to be on the cards, especially at the moment with this whole 2 million per week vaccinations, which just seems ridiculous that they're going to be able to kind of carry that out considering how inept they've been with everything else that's come prior. So the only other thing they can do is resort back to adding another tier on top of the one we have already at the moment, which is just barn crazy but hey what can you do says so from the guardian it says tier five england faces new possible covid restrictions sources say um further current virus restrictions could be introduced in england akin to a tier five lockdown a government source has suggested as experts warned the current curbs might not be enough to shrink the pan epidemic tier four restrictions came into force in london and parts of southeast of england on 20th of december and have since been extended to a swath of the country from cambridge to sussex and parts of hampshire under these restrictions people have been told to stay at home with household mixing banned outside of support bubbles although one person can meet up with another person outdoors with the incubation period of the virus lasting up to 14 days experts say the impact of the such measures in some areas might be expected to be seen in the coming days however an analysis in the spread of the new highly transmissible coronavirus variant by experts in the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine released this month warned that even in the whole of england even if the whole of england were placed under tier 4 restrictions 
terms of Boxing Day until the end of January, their number would not fall below one. Do you hear what they're saying there? Even if we're all under the tightest restrictions, we will still be F-U-C-K-E-D, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Madness. How did we get our soul to this position, man? Anyway, it continues. Um, now it seems that there could be plans to introduce new restriction measures to try and keep the virus under control. According to the Mirror, a Whitehall source said that the Tier 4 rules do not appear to be working, and the government could introduce another level of Tier 4, so it's like a Tier 5. <laughs> While no details have been made released as to what the tier could look like or whether it could be called tier 5, one possibility is that the time measures could include closing the schools, majority of people moving to education online. And supposedly, what I've seen online is that, yeah, obviously closing of schools. And then the other thing that's going to be a real big um, uh, shock to a lot of people's systems is the introduction of a curfew. I've read it's going to be a 10 p.m. So it's going to be a bit later than everyone else is doing at the moment. But it's going to be essentially a curfew put in place that's going to ban anyone from being outdoors. I think that's going to be the end of outdoor exercises, you know, uh, for the most part. But I'm assuming most things have to end by 10 a.m. or maybe 10 p.m., kind of mirroring what Spain did in, you know, in the beginning of the COVID where they sort of had these windows where certain groups of people could go out and could come in. Um, so it's going to be a real culture shock, man. Like I said, if ever there was a time... It's, it's going to be a real shock to the system in general, not culture, shock, shock to the system. If ever there's a time for you to kind of fortify your mind, body and soul, this would be it. We're going to be in, we're going to be in this, in this shit for a long time, maybe another year, quite possibly another two years. Um, so don't um, kind of give yourself this false hope that somehow on January 1st, things are going to be returned back to normal. You're going to be able to go and do your thing. That's not going to happen. Fortify your mind, body, and soul that we're going to be living under these stringent lockdown measures for a foreseeable future, especially with the complete ineptitude of whatever government that you kind of reside in, especially in the West. We have no idea how to deal with this thing. We're adding tears on top of tears on top of tears. We have Boris Johnson, you know, with a sniper gun outside number 10 Downing Street making sure that everyone's inside their rooms or inside their homes it's a complete and absolute horror show but hopefully it works out and it hopefully that's the hope my hope is it does work out um i am um both pessimistic and optimistic hopefully things work out moving on let's crack on and leave all that stuff behind for once yes this is hilarious <laughs> no pun intended so this lady called hilaria baldwin um, who I had no idea who she was prior to this whole um, controversy online, um, happens to be the wife of Alec Baldwin, right, who kind of has gained a sort of third, fifth, eighth, tenth wind uh, during the Trump presidency because he does essentially the crappy impressions of Trump during Saturday Night Live, SNL. If you guys are not familiar with it, a little comedy sketch show thing, he usually plays Trump in that. And, um, yeah, I guess she just, she's... I don't know this guy's wife she's pretty well known I guess in the states but I'm not really that familiar with her but this story broke all over social and people have been going absolutely nuts over it and it's really really hilarious because um I never knew this was a thing um and um, it's also kind of interesting to see what kind of um you know textbook elites rich and famous people who don't have any real obstacles and have uh, struggles in their life will do in order to seem somewhat normal or somewhat regular right because if there's a lot of that right a lot of these sort of like highfalutin white women who have never had to struggle a day in their life wanting to appear quirky so that they got a personality so like oh you know i'm not just rich i'm also got a personality i'm also into these crazy things i also like to do these ridiculous things i also have this weird habit that this would tick you know what i mean you're sort of kind of constructing a personality for yourself in order to make yourself far more interesting than what you actually are and you know for the most part it's harmless right you see those Emma Chamberlain type girls. They essentially, you know, um, spawned loads of clones of her. Is this all over the places, right? Scrunch on her wrist, massive flask, talking endlessly about their anxiety and star signs and boys and all that nonsense. It can be pretty harmless, but in some in some aspects, especially when it pertains to adults, especially when it pertains to sort of quasi socialites or mum, you know, uh, stay at home mums, it can be very, very, very dangerous. The, the delusion can be very, very real, and this is one of these examples. So it's from the BBC. It says the following. Hilaria Baldwin denies faking Spanish heritage. Right? Absolutely hilarious article, right? Let's go. Oh, no, it's moving it. Come on, let's move it back. 
It says, Hilaria Baldwin, podcaster and wife of the actor Alec Baldwin, has responded to claims that she misled the public about her Spanish heritage. Miss Baldwin, a popular yoga instructor, has been accused of social media of faking a Spanish accent. Again, how popular is she really? These, some of these articles, they, they kind of gas up the people a little bit, innit? A popular yoga instructor, how popular is she really? She's popular, of course, because she's Alec Baldwin's wife, right? And she's a rather attractive older lady. But is she a, is she a really a popular yoga instructor? Really? Is she really, you know, doing numbers in the in the in the uh, yoga teaching um, world? Is she is does her name ring really in that industry? Come on, let's be serious. Anyway, it continues. In a seven minute video on, on Instagram, Miss Bolden said she was born in Boston but was partly raised in Spain. However, her management biography on her states um, that she was born in the Spanish island of Mallorca, which is super funny because, you know, she speaks Spanish fluently. But, you know, if you know anything about Spain, you'll know that if she's from Mallorca, then she should be able to speak Basque. Well, she doesn't have, she doesn't, right? She's not made any indication that she can speak Catalan or in any way, shape or form. She's just, you know, existing with the Spanish. <laughs> So she also previously claimed the interview that she did not move to the United States until she was 19 to attend university in New York, which is a complete lie. She said, I've seen chat online questioning my identity and culture, Miss Baldwin wrote. This is something I take very seriously. And for those who are asking, I'll retake my story as I've done many times before. I was born in Boston and grew up spending my time with my family between Massachusetts and Spain. My parents and siblings live in Spain and I chose to live here in the US. We celebrate both cultures in our home. Alec and I are raising our children bilingual just as we as I was raised. Which again is utterly still odd anyway, right? That you'd have I guess celebrate tradition is one thing or cultures, but you would assume a lot of that would come from some sort of tie to the country that you're living in, right? When you wouldn't go, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe people are different. You wouldn't go super, you know, balls to the wall with the whole Spanish cultural thing if you just happen to be an expat, right? It would have to be something that tied you to it, whether or not you had a business that you shared with a with a Spanish native, your partner was Spanish, um, you were looking after someone that's Spanish. I don't know, something that actually tied you to the fabric of that country, just as opposed to just living there, right, as somebody would means. That's what essentially it looks like, right? They have means, um, they have the ability to move around, they wanted to give their kids a broader sense of the world, open their horizons, allow them to learn new language, Whatever, right but still is that enough to kind of throw yourself fully into the spanish thing and celebrate the cultures and make it seem as if your siblings are from there when they just live there just like you have lived in the united states that's a bit strange but hey we could digress miss bolden explained that her accent can change because she regularly switches between spanish and english adding that she mixes in the two of them when she gets nervous or upset she said in the video that she had grown up using the name hillary in the u.s and hilaria in spain before later con cons consolidating on the Hilaria which is again another bullshit excuse her name is Hillary and somehow she convinced herself that you know Hilaria is the um is the one for one translation of Hillary in Spain, which is not right. It's, it's a little bit more complex than that, as you would probably, you know, led yourself to believe. And um, you can't just take a name and just try and put in Dracul translate and think, yeah, that's the exact same thing. It doesn't work like that. But regardless, even if that's the case, right, as a grown adult, she gave herself, it's all like people, I always, I'm always, 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 always skeptical of people, adults especially, who give themselves nicknames, right? Who um, just, just for the sake of it because there's always something a little bit mentally unwell with somebody that does that there's always some sort of a uh, delusion um borderline borderline personality disorder right bpd that going on in there that would allow a grown-up to decide to give themselves a, a, a kind of a nickname that you should that you know more often than not comes through experience and living life as an adolescent it just kind of gets you know it kind of gets bestowed upon you and more often than not it's not a nickname that you actually like it's something that you sort of endears you to a group of people that uh, might have been bullying you for the best part of three years so you're just happy that they just, they just stop punching you in the face but it's not exactly something that you kind of tattoo on yourself it's just something that you your friends who have known you for most of your life sort of you know um endearly call you by but it's not something that you sort of pin your high identity on so that's why it makes it utterly bizarre and also the fact that your name is Hillary and you go to Spain and people are calling you Hilaria because that's how their, their accent kind of permits doesn't then mean it's an excuse for you to change your name because I think that's what she said in the video. She says that, oh, when she was going to Spain, people called her Hilaria, when she came back to the US, called her Hillary and her documents were all messed up. It's like, no, they weren't. You would fill, she would fill out her name as Hilaria in one place and Hillary in another place so that she then decided, okay, my name is Hillary. 
still it makes no sense it's just absolutely baloney isn't it <laughs> it continues says suspicion started to rise after claims about her heritage went viral on social media a video of miss bolden asking how to say cucumber in english also appeared to wacky circuit so i'm gonna i'm gonna put that up here on screen because i think that is quite possibly one of the most funniest things i've ever seen but it's also not that uncommon i remember when i was growing up in school especially um prior to this whole renaissance of you know uh black entertainment and just you know uh black self-love that's happening here in the uk which is beautiful to see there was this weird thing with africans and caribbeans where somehow africans felt i don't know um less than when it came to caribbeans well i guess because caribbean culture at that time had been embraced a lot more than african culture um and there'll be a lot of people who kind of said that they were quarter dominican trinidadian jamaican whatever it may be just so that they could um you know just so they could kind of add some flavor to what they were about no one really wanted to pin their hat and say hey i am this person they wanted to kind of you know just slip around it and not really make it too obvious so I do kind of understand that need. I do kind of understand, um, not that need, that uh, the pressure that comes with all that sort of stuff. But I think when you're somebody of means and you're somebody that's rich and got, you know, access and all this sort of malarkey and you've got the ability to maneuver and reward as you please, this kind of weird thing of wanting to appear like a regular schmegular and then co-opting an entire culture identity so it can bolster your image is just utterly utterly insane and here's the thread right here on um on twitter that blew everything up right this random person i don't even know if this is an actual it seems like a human right um elena ilna alana alina ilana not whatever someone yet it says and they are what a finance professional living in brooklyn so they tweeted the following you said you have to admire hilaria baldwin's commitment to her um, decade-long grift where she impersonates a spanish person so she i guess this person was just bored on december 21st sitting in their apartment in queens just thought you know what let me give it to this girl and she had all these clips on deck ready to go first one fake spanish accent debut this woman grew up in massachusetts <laughs> so look at her speaking spanish on a or kind of speaking with a spanish accent during an interview uh, on american television how's married life married life is really nice you know it feels different it really feels different but i didn't think it was going to be different but it feels quite different what's so. the thing that surprised you the most um i think just the fact that it feels different you know i we, we like to say husband and wife a lot yeah um, I this is far worse than racial dollars are racial dollars story was i guess um she was she was treated she was treated unfairly african now that we've sort of kind of been able to take stock of the situation when you sort of look at her story and see the amounts of trauma that she'd had to deal deal with um dysfunctional family and the fact that she was kind of you know um the first time she sort of uh uh, experience love in a family setting was happened to be with a black family in the u.s it made complete sense why she'd want to um identify herself with the black culture again the way she did it was a bit bizarre but in terms of explaining how somebody's trauma can lead them to doing some questionable things and maybe uh, going about it in a very questionable manner that is more um that's something that you could excuse a lot more right than this story than this kind of wealthy well-to-do massachusetts girl deciding that she wants to now be latina because um it's far more interesting than her middle american upbringing which it isn't right there's no interest there's no more of there's no less than whatever it is embrace who you are and live your truth but these people are idiots there's another clip here it says um here she is pretending not to know how to say a cucumber in english <laughs> and you see this a lot with um who's that girl mackenzie dern right the ufc fighter she's american right for all intents and purposes but her father is a very well-known brazilian jiu-jitsu um martial artist um of course he's brazilian you know to the core accent and all and her mother is spanish but she grew up speaking english in america so she speaks with a regular american accent then somehow through the process of learning how to to, to learning jiu-jitsu and going back and forth to brazil she developed this accent where she looks she sounds like english is a second language not a first which is really strange because usually that sort of flip or switch happens in your teenage years right because i remember i've got this one story this girl called rebecca who everyone kind of had a hot spot back in the day when we were in school or we were, yeah we we're in secondary school in the area 
I remember when she moved to Birmingham, right? And that was a big deal, right? She was like kind of the, the first person in that area but under the age of 18 that sort of left London. Like, what the fuck? She lived in London. Why would you leave London for? And of course, all the boys were kind of upset, you know, because they were kind of liked her. They wanted to leave. But I remember when she first came back, it was so weird when she came back like a couple years later. I think she was 18. She must live in 16, come around, 18. And she had a complete brummy accent. Like, and she's from ends, right? She had a completely brummy accent. And we, and we just couldn't figure it out. Like, what the hell was going on? How did she have this accent? But then later on, when you grow up, you sort of realize, oh, yeah, she was going through her sort of adolescent maturity sort of stage, kind of, you know, um, where you're sort of kind of figuring out who you are. And at that time, when you're trying to assimilate and you want to just make friends, you are going to, um, you are going to sort of, without realizing, you're going to try your best to um take on everything that's around you in order to you to fit in whether that's the accent mannerisms or whatever it may be but it's very unlikely that you would kind of somehow have a brummy accent just because you decide to move to birmingham at the age of 22 it just doesn't make any sense right you, maybe you use some slang or some words but you wouldn't exactly come out with a completely brum accent just it just seems a bit odd it's another video of her speaking in a regular american accent now um where did your accent go hmm I have recorded this like 20 different times in many different places saying many different things and I think the reason that I'm stressing about it so much is that I'm so passionate about what I'm going to tell you. It's wax lean. Have you ever seen my big fat Greek wedding and you know how the father is like obsessed with Windex? This is my Windex. And it continues here. It says from a review from a podcast, this woman also claimed to have moved to the United States because she went to go in IU. So this is uh, someone, I guess, put in a, a review on the podcast of the following. Hillary needs to stop interrupting. She says, I know Hillary Haywood Thomas, Thomas from Cambridge School of Winston, Massachusetts. She didn't have an accent then and didn't change her name to Hilaria because she's not Spanish. So please stop using an accent on this podcast, interrupting your guest, which is a mad, mad reveal, right? This was, I guess, uh, what was that? October, someone let us review. And another clip here where this tweet says the following Hillary's Google results say she was born in Spain, born to a Spanish mother, right? And yet here here, here we have her very American sounding mother talking about growing up in Massachusetts and Hillary's grandfather was a college professor in nineteen sixties Longmead. So it's not even like she's um you know, it's not even like she's like faking her own sort of like birthright. It's her entire family history. There's no ounce of Spanish in her whatsoever. She's just a regular American girl who obviously fell in love with Spanish culture, wanted to add a bit of sauce to her life and decided to co-op this entire fake identity. And here's what her mom sounds like. Especially touched to be returning to my alma mater. My father, Charles Hayward, who was the art professor here from 1969 to 1987, is here, as you just heard as is my mom, Irene, and other good friends from the community where I grew up. They even sound alike isn't it, when they speak English like regularly. Um, next tweet, and says, um, no, she's not Spanish on her father's side either. Here's a obituary of her grandfather. Her paternity family has been in the United States since it was a British colony. So they're more American than Americans. Uh, it says here, here's her pretending her native language is Spanish. This is a quote, I guess, this is an article clipping um, speaking about Hilaria says the following Hilaria was born in Spain has made certain to raise her children with her native language Spanish she says I speak to them in Spanish and it does not speak Spanish so he speaks them in English he will try to he will try like a little bit and then next year Carmen is going to bilingual school and that's the other shocking part of it her children's names as well Carmen Rafael whatever whatever it's like God almighty woman um, she says I'm excited to put her in an environment where she'll be around children who speak both languages just imagine how traumatizing that must be for your kids i think it's you know it's all well and good being bpd on your own single right it's like i think that's why people don't really maybe that's why some people are like to were tolerating trisha before she kind of decided that or kind of said out loud that she went into family and now she's essentially who's she marrying she's engaged to um healer from hbh3's brother right and people are kind of freaking out that this person's gonna have children i think it's fine to be a little bit of a nutcase on your own because you don't affect anybody but the moment you sort of have a family um kids you know near you people start to get very very worried because that level of um uh mental illness that level of delusion 
um, that level of just uh, all over the placedness is not conducive to a stable household. So you can just imagine how the kids are dealing with this, having, you know, having their mum being essentially being exposed online as a complete fake. Like, because you can't blame the children. For sure, they've been told their entire life that they have Spanish ancestry, right? They've been made to speak Spanish at home. They probably have, um, I'm assuming, Central to South American uh, nannies that come through who speak Spanish to them in the home as well. So Spanish is particularly perfect and all this bloody malarkey. But little do they know, their mom's completely faking it the entire time. Mad, isn't it? It says here, but her native language is certainly English because here is her mother's bio, which notes that she graduated from the BU Medical School in 1986 and then she had a 20 year career in Massachusetts. Hilary, Hilaria Hillary was born in 1984. Mum would have been in medical school in Boston. So this whole idea that she went to Spain is completely mute. I forgot to include here the link. Um, and it says here, <laughs> Hilaria has children with the following names. Carmen, Gabriela, Rafael, Thomas, Leonardo, Angel, David, Romeo, Alejandro, Eduardo, Paco, Lucas. Jesus Christ. Like, uh, and then of course, Alec Baldwin is there suffering as well with it. And it's just, it's, it's a funny story, man. It really is one of the most hilarious stories that you would ever see. And maybe... um the the kind of response to it has been interesting too there's been a lack of vit i've seen i've not seen the same level of vitriol that was pointed toward rachel dolezal when like i said i mentioned before her story made a lot more sense and there's a lot more pain attached to it you could actually sympathize with her position of how she kind of grew up and why she felt kind of um co-opting a black identity would make sense for her at that particular time but for somebody like a hilaria baldwin right with all the privileges and means that she's had in her entire life to decide oh no i'm actually going to co-opt um, spanish culture and use that as my identity to sort of put my hat on because i don't think i have anything else to offer and somehow dupe my family into believing this lie too that is really unforgivable and I, I, again like praise go out to that family man how they're going to deal with this internally because it's both embarrassing and also super debilitating because it's like you know if she's lying about this what else has she's lied about over the years like it just opens up a whole complete can of worms and it's interesting too that she didn't have any like until she got called out as well some of these people man this is what sometimes people say you know some people are like oh when somebody rich or somebody wealthy does something you know um objectively evil people are like oh they're not gonna sleep well at night it's like no they will they sleep like babies they have no remorse they have no um re they have no sort of not re they have no sort of regret they have no shame zero because this lady knew all this time because again i have no idea who hilario gomez or sorry hilario bolden gomez was prior to this but the noise the kind of chatter in the industry in the scene was you know pretty loud people were speaking about this openly it's sort of like the same sort of thing people do in a black community with sean king right people don't believe he's black so it's not like he or she doesn't know people are saying these things they just choose to ignore it and just keep on keeping on but imagine knowing well you know within yourself that you are not the person that you paint yourself out to be but she was very clever too because i think in, in none of the documents i've found so far did she specifically say that she was born in spain she just kind of alluded to it she let people kind of interpret that she let people sort of fill in the blanks but she didn't um correct them in any way shape or form so that, i think that's a clever part of it but again it does show a very manipulative and conniving and somewhat dangerous person that they could keep and lie like this up for what the best part of 30 plus years whilst having five kids with a guy who is under the illusion that you are spanish as well like it's absolutely heinous really really heinous again i guess the benefit is that the kids get to learn a new language regardless right they're never going to lose spanish so i think that's great um you know and being uh, i think you know americans for the most part are well regarded as probably the less um cultured of uh our global populace out there so it is a good thing that these kids from wealthy backgrounds have essentially been exposed to this a whole entire different culture and be able to see a completely different side of the world even though it's probably the same sort of um wealth bracket because i'm sure they're not staying in random airbnbs when they're going out to her home <laughs> in mallorca but god damn it man this must be embarrassing to kind of you know especially for all those especially if you watch them 
uh, uh, the undoing. You'd know how clicky those little schools and um, can be, especially those little private schools with all the uh, middle, uh, upper class families and parents coming off the school. And you just imagine all the gossip that's kind of occurring on the playground now with this issue or, it, or over Zoom or over the Facebook groups and stuff. This is utterly, utterly, utterly insane. Um, but big up Hilaria Baldwin, man. I wonder now if this should be exposed, if she'll go back to calling herself Hillary or if she'll just keep the name Hilaria. And I like how she kind of purposely, um, you know, a adopted this look where she had the dark hair, um, the sort of paley, olivey, pasty skin, the, <laughs> the way she spoke and shit. Like, this lady is absolutely batshit crazy. And her apology was even worse as well. Um, quite possibly maybe the worst apology of all time <laughs> but hey what do i know let's move on man oh absolute legends absolute legends you gotta love these, you gotta love these people you really have to love these people next on this was to be heavier ba -ba 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 -ba. yeah so this is a this is an intro so this is um a video from wildside hip-hop and it says the following Two yes, the following two sneaker store employees. Yes, two sneaker store employees both get fired after being exposed for backdooring raffle for the new Kobe Six Grinches on TikTok. So of course, you know, like most sneakerheads are aware, this whole backdooring of shoes has been, you know, happening since the beginning of time. Even when we used to queue outside the stores, essentially the whole idea would be um Nike would send a store and all uh, 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 would allocate a store a certain amount of shoes to sell of a particular limited edition trainer that everyone was that's high, hugely highly in demand and then um whatever would be sent to a store the kind of store would have their own dedicated or you know contact book of people that they sort of deal with friends and family who they sort of look after you know friends whatever they may be high celeb uh, celebrities whatever the likes and they would sort of kind of um put aside a certain amount of pets for them and then whatever was left over will be made available to the public so there was always the idea we always knew we had no assumption that if nike said they sent a thousand pairs over to the uk that that store would get a thousand pairs right we knew that some would go to seeding some would be backdoored some would be slipped under a table never to be seen again like you know a certain so and so did at 94 yeah a couple of few times but you know we kind of accepted it but there was still the possibility that more often than not there was still a, a way more available for the public to buy that gave an option to you know you had access or the opportunity to buy if you queued up ahead of time now obviously with all these new sneaker apps and this whole weird queuing system uh rsvping uh, liking of pictures and stuff it's just gotten really really annoying this year more so especially being at home and having to you know notify yourself on a sneakers app and shit and i don't know man about you guys but i'm just over it i'm just fed up i'm over it and I don't know why we just keep accepting this lie that the sneaker, you know, brands have at the moment where they're um, unable or unwilling, uh, unwillingness to just manufacture more shoes. Uh, sneaker culture is now a billion dollar industry, right? Um, everybody under the sun buys rare or limited edition trainers, whether it's a flip or to wear. It's not a thing that's sort of reserved for a small subculture of people on certain forums. It's global. It's worldwide. It's... Um, it doesn't discriminate between genders or ages everybody knows about shoes now at the moment so there is um a, there is an appetite for them right so you would assume that a lot of these companies will just want to make more or just allow people more access to actually purchase them because i don't understand for the life of me why you can buy a ps5 you know of course maybe not now because stocks are low but eventually if you're willing to wait you know you're going to get a ps5 then it's not like you're never going to be able to get one but some of these shoes when they come out you just see them being advertised online you see all these influencers wearing them on your social media feed and there's no need of for some of these brands to send out shoes to certain influencers because what's the point of showing us shoes that we're never going to be able to wear ourselves anyway you're essentially just stroking the ego of the influencer and really not marketing the shoe to anybody that really wants to wear them because they're never going to get them anyway um so i'd much rather see a little bit more um 
not democratization, but just more access to rare trainers so that we don't end up in situations like this where it appears like these two gentlemen won a raffle for these limited edition Kobe six Grinches, went up to the store to go collect them, and then the staff members made up lies that they somehow got there outside of their pickup window and that the shoes are now gone, which is essentially um, evidence of some sort of backdoor dealings, or maybe they were sort of offered um, a huge amount of cash up front for the shoes, and because they're retail assistants and they probably make shitty money, they were like, you know what, I'm going to take that and just hopefully if I lie to the right person, they're just going to keep it moving. Because in in more cases than not, because I've worked in training stores, you can get away with that lie, especially when it's somebody that's not that experienced with shoes, doesn't really know what goes on behind the scenes. They can be gutted, but they can sort of like, oh man, I wish I would have got here a bit earlier, right? But if you're talking to an actual sneakerhead that's been buying shoes for a good while and knows what happens behind the scenes, there's no way they're going to believe you that somehow they happen to come there at the wrong time. It's just not going to run. So let's play the video and hear what they have to say. <clears throat> Here today, Sheik, they are not guaranteeing me my damn Kobe's. Me and this fella right here, we cannot get our shoes because they said they don't have them, even though we won them on the raffle. Yeah. You got two. this number right here. It does not work. To wait for to let no, they told me 11 to 4. They don't have our shoe. They're sitting here right now, not working with me and my man right here. Are you sure you don't have a 12 and a half? No. To make things simple, give me a 12 and a half and give my man the 12. And they can't give us a shoe. And supposedly those girls got those girls got fired. And again, um, I don't blame the girls too tough because again, working in retail, you get paid shitty wages. It is what it is. This is all a symptom of the greed of sneaker companies, right? Of not allowing fans and customers alike. And people like myself just want to buy the shoes, right? My days of queuing up in front of a store in the cold, um, eating a McDonald's and busting joke with my friends, although they were some of the best experiences I had growing up and were very formative in terms of my interests, in terms of my social group. That's not something I want to revisit. I've got the means, I've got the disposal disposable income and i've got the um access or you know especially with internet or that i don't know whatever it may be to get these shoes allow me to buy them and if you want to allow you know the younger generation option to kind of queue up in front of stores to make it a little bit more of a chase give them the opportunity as well but the idea that you can buy the latest iphone the latest computer console for the most part most bits of fashion if you're you know put your finger on a buzzer but you somehow can't get a hold of shoes and once they're gone they're gone completely is insane considering like i said sneak industry is a billion dollar industry if anything every shoe these brands are putting out there they're hoping it's the next easy it's not like they're putting out shoes and just flying them out there willy-nilly all these brands are treating their sneaker releases similar to like i forgot who the advice was it might have been quincy jones where they said um, you should treat every record that you're making like a hit single right because you never know what's going to catch i think a lot of these companies are doing the same thing with these new models they're putting out all these new trainers they're putting out all these new retros um, these new shapes collaborations whatever it may be updates on the soul bloody blah blah updates on a classic model and they're hoping that that is a shoe that's going to become a cult classic that's what they're hoping so if that's the case allow more more people to purchase them allow more people because this whole scarce this whole kind of manufactured scarcity thing doesn't work it just makes it harder for the people that actually want to get the shoes not to get them and also if anything if you look at it it kind of dilutes this reselling business the industry of reselling isn't necessarily um it doesn't really make any sense right why is it that a paris dunk is far more it's like you know 10 times maybe 15 times the value of something that came out recently just because it's actually the paris dunk actually has a story actually has doesn't have manufactured scarcity and it's actually something that people actually want all the stuff has been manufactured scarcity stuff on the line the prices are really odd so there even the resale market has been affected by this weird um resistance or reluctance for these brands to just manufacture shoes for the people that actually want to wear it and then again look who suffers it's the people on the bottom of the rungs that ladder these two girls who probably going to make a bit of extra cash during the holiday period during the pandemic they thought they could grab a quick lick off the back of these guys not knowing that these guys were well informed and now they've essentially lost their job even though i'm assuming they got a bit of money in their back pocket but still it's like look who's having to pay the price of such a thing guys i'm aware of the situation already i'm already in contact with my grandparents and corporate we are going to figure out what's going on those two employees 
okay, that's a bit retarded. You know what I mean? If you're a grown man, you're having to contact your grandparents to get in touch with the corporate, you're a big man child. That I don't condone. Is that you are talking to, we plan on firing them and hiring new employees pretty soon. And we're going to try to find and allocate those. Oh, sorry. That's the actual owner of the store. I take that back. That seems like the owner of the store who's basically saying, hey, I'm aware of what's going on. We're firing the store employees that did that. I'm guessing the grandparents own that store or they're the sort of mum and pup sort of um, faces of the store. Okay, I take that back. I, I, I thought I was just, I thought I was one of the sneakerheads. Kobe's for you guys because, you know, my family built that brand from scratch and I hate it when, you know, greedy and shady employees do things like that and sell things behind our backs because that doesn't do anything for ourselves and our brand. So we'll take care of you. I'm going to look into it and I'll have them fired ASAP. Fair play again. He, he stepped up to the plate. But again, I think a lot of this can be rectified via the sneaker brands taking ownership and deciding, hey, we see that all you kids love these shoes and guys and adults like myself, here's access to the shoes that you want to purchase. Hopefully you purchase them within this window. Once that window's gone, it's cool. But again, there's not enough quantities. The windows are small. The uh, access to the options to buy are flipping annoying. I don't want to have to like a flipping Instagram profile, make a one minute video, um, you know, film myself wanking. Like it's just long. Like all that is long. Let me buy the shoes. Let me keep myself moving and allow all this other circus stuff. That's my opinion. But hey, what do I know? What do I know? What else do we have here to talk about? Yes, okay, so let's look at this. Um, obviously, you guys are aware that Andrew Schultz from Flagrant 2 and also Brilliant Idiots fame has got a pretty decent special out now at the moment called Andrew Schultz Saves America, right? I've watched two episodes of it so far. I'm really enjoying it. Um, He's one of my favorites, I think, in the whole stand-up comedy podcast world. I think he's really funny. I know he's not for some, you know, some people. He's, he's he has a certain, um, he, yeah, he has a certain appeal, right? I know some people can kind of look at him and he can kind of be a bit annoying. And I have to be honest too. In the beginning, when he first started on Brilliant Idiots and he had that sort of weird tiff with Charlemagne, he didn't he rubbed me up the wrong way. But I think he was going through a lot of stuff personally outside the podcast that he was sort of having to deal with. You know, I'm sure his career wasn't where he wanted to be either. The moment he started to gain a bit of success and his career started to get a bit of wings, he started to come, you know, become his own sort of like media empire mogul type of dude. Um, his entire personality and how you approach it and now no he how he came across on podcast definitely improved um over the last few years and i've definitely been a fan of the stuff he's been putting out there and um, especially the flagrant two podcast right i love how they sort of uh, talk about such a broad range of topics in a really comedic way big big fan so of course he dropped the you know his comedy special um that he put together with netflix um and short saves america did it of course in a very interesting way it's less of a comedy special and more so of his sort of interpretation of those sort of like news daily show things that they do in america which are pretty you know uh, except for the exception of a couple of sketches are on that aren't the most funny things in the world and he basically proved the fact that here yeah, if you get funny people telling funny jokes um about serious topics it can, can kind of like ease the seriousness and sort of add a bit of light to very dark topics so it seems like um off the back of the success of such a thing with Netflix, his ex-girlfriend called Sarah Phillips decided to come out and essentially um, allude to the fact that he might be abusive, right? And it's thrown up some interesting questions as to how women, I guess, speak about such issues in public, especially when they're dealing with somebody who has notoriety, who's going through their press run, blah, 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 blah. And also how the person that's been accused of it aka andrew schultz um approaches the subject too because from the time of me recording it so far he hasn't addressed it one bit he hasn't given it any light he hasn't even mentioned it in one even in a passing phrase or joke he's completely ignored it and for the most part it seems to be working it doesn't seem to be gathering any steam even though again he's under the netflix banner which does add a bit of scrutiny and unwanted attention from some of the blue check mark com comedic journalists that exist out there but he, he seems to have kind of well, for lack of a better term got away with it and it's interesting to see considering what everyone else is going through uh, you know at, you know in the comedy space so this is a screenshot here it's from it's sarah phillips and it says the following so she kind of wrote this statement regarding andrew schultz and what he's doing so it said the following here i've been thinking a lot of whether or not to speak on this but i'm hoping that if i do now i can hopefully never speak on it again and we can leave it in the confines of a dumpster fire year we've all had 
I want to ask that those who have those who continue to harass me and my loved ones tag me in posts, send me disgusting messages regarding an ex boyfriend of mine. Please, please stop. This has gone a consistent. This has gone on consistently from the end of that relationship nearly six years ago and continues to now. So she essentially is insinuating that fans of Flagrant Two, fans of Andrew Schultz, have been harassing her from the time that they broke up to now. Um, I guess rubbing his success in her face, trolling her, whatever they may do now there's no evidence of this usually when people are going through such a thing they would take screenshots and upload them and stuff but you know i'm sure she's probably having to deal with whatever she's dealing with when it comes to stuff so you don't maybe want to relive that trauma but it does seem a little bit fishy that she would suggest that she would kind of insinuate this is a thing but not provide any evidence of it again doesn't have to explain yourself in that way but it just seems a bit odd that would say regardless right but i can i can picture this thing happening i can picture fans of somebody because you know online fans are fanatical right they're super weird um they're super um um what was that called is it territorial not territorial whatever that thing was club and club v club right even when somebody's wrong they still can kind of ride for their guy or girl to a very nauseating level it's not really cool but hey continues here she said in the last few days i've been um, inundated with unwanted comments messages and questions presumably related to the decision made by netflix to release show saves america i have not and will not watch it but i have seen the backlash it has received not really a lot of backlash to be fair a couple of journalists have some have some choice words to say about it have they've of course done the, la the lazy standard thing they always do when somebody sort of calls out people on the left they sort of you know essentially labeled him as a right-wing grifter um but for the most part i've seen some people maybe comment on his maybe off-color jokes but again he's a comedian should be able to say what he wants to say as long as it's funny but i've not really seen that much backlash which might be the reason why she decided to come out of the story in the first place right it continues uh, for me even opening netflix on my tv in my home has been completely triggering to have see to have to see the face of somebody who abused me for years is something that i wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy and it's funny that that sounds exactly like the thing that the girl said that accused chris the leah right when the first taxations came through she was essentially at home bored scanning through netflix and it happened to stumble upon you watch the second season and seeing chris i think in the first i think he's in the second episode and it's like what that's the guy that did x y and z to me right and so it triggered and she went on a whole twitter tirade and then that opened a floodgate so loads of other girls stepping up and saying yeah he did that he did this he did this to me so it's just funny that I guess it's funny to observe from the outside in the amount of people that are getting cancelled due to the victims or the alleged victims just being at home and sort of kind of having time to think about the things that they've sort of been through in the last few years, um, ruminating on issues, good or bad, and then deciding, you know what, this is the time I take a stand. This is the time I speak up for themselves. So if ever there was a time to get cancelled, this is, again, like I said previously in other shows, this is possibly the worst time to get cancelled because everyone's got time everyone's got time everyone's bored everyone is their own little investigative journalist and everyone kind of wants to have a reason to live and there's no better reason to live than inserting yourself other people's drama in it it's absolutely maddening it continues here it says i'm aware that i am that i owe no one an explanation and the people close to me have known the private details of the relationship for years but i don't know what else uh, will make people think twice next time before taking time out of their day to harass me about it which is again she keeps mentioning it so i'm gonna say she's probably leaning on the truth of it um you you'd, you're a complete weirdo if you're messaging ex-girlfriends of people that you follow on podcasts and harassing them i don't know what kind of guy or girl does that and thinks that's funny it isn't um even if they had some sort of that's the issue with this stuff right because if you have a partner if you if you have a public podcast and you bring on your partner on the podcast and you have this sort of like bantery jovial uh adolescent take the mickey out of each other on the show um relationship it sort of inadvert inadvertently opens up the floodgates for strangers who don't know you to also jump in and start insulting you right it, which is obviously not funny and not cool because you don't know these people so you have to be very careful about how you speak about your partner i think in public you have to kind of treat it with kid gloves or make sure that you let people know that hey i'm not going to stand for x y and z or just keep it private um i think that's where it gets a bit murky but even if that's the case you, you know it's six years on you have to if if he moved on fans have to move on as well i think that's utterly utterly odd it continues here for years i was manipulated controlled and abused by him the verbal abuse was constant i was isolated from my friends if i wore makeup that he thought was too much he'd wipe it off my face in public which is uh, <laughs> sometimes you hear some things right and it's always the, it's kind of like the first time you've heard it you're like what 
And I heard that I read it the first time. I was like, Dude, are there men out there that exist who get what? Um, what was it triggered? Who get um, who feel inadequate when their girlfriends look attractive when they go out together? Like, isn't that bizarre? Like, wouldn't the whole reason why you get with somebody that is overtly attractive is the fact that you are attracted by their looks in the first place? And of course, you got to know them as a person, blah, blah, blah. But you like the fact that you're with this really hot girl and she's really into you. And she likes the fact that she's really into this, what she thinks is a hot guy and she you're really into her, right? It's a kind of mutual uh, attraction, right? That sort of just works. It is what it is. But I always, I, also, I always sort of assumed people that were dating really, really attractive people like you know cl classic tens you knew that person was a 10 and you kind of prided yourself on going into a room making every guy every guy's neck twist and snap but also being secure in the knowledge that even though their necks are twisting and they're making you know lewd remarks under their breaths you're the one taking her home you're the one that's living with her. You're the one that gets to spend the rest of your life with her, right? That would kind of give you a bit of pride. You don't necessarily care unless someone stepped over to the mark. But the most part, you take some pride in the fact that you've got a really attractive girlfriend on your arm. Why would you be triggered and wanting to wipe up makeup? That's really, really odd. And as well, oddly specific for somebody that I would, if you were if you're somebody that's sitting out there thinking, oh, she's making it up. It's oddly specific thing to say, isn't it? about somebody um even if you did it once it's really odd like i've never heard of it in my entire life it's super super strange but again it maybe says a lot about his internal um struggles and all this sort of stuff who knows we don't know any of these people but just reading the the, the words on the screen that screams that screams abuse in it like that is if ever there was a if ever there was an example of a microaggression that would be it um it continues um he'd force me to change before leaving the house if he thought my outfit would get too much attention um once after uh, being sick for weeks without explanation i found out that he had been using my toothbrush to clean his bottom of his shoes to this day i can't make sense of that kind of sickness which is again another odd thing i've never heard um i guess it's sort of like a weird power play like a dominance thing or maybe it's just like a purely careless college room brat boy thing where the first thing you grab is a toothbrush you just use that to clean someone's shoes but i i would assume you would know what your partner's toothbrush is and what is you know a spare thing or something that you use to kind of you know scrub uh scrub around the taps of your bathroom or something that's just an odd thing to do like it's just yeah again god almighty man uh andrew what are you doing brother he says on another one on another occasion on a vacation in aruba his anger got so out of control that i had to hide from him in the hotel bathroom with the door locked soon after i began having panic attacks almost every night there are other things that happened during the relationship that i'll probably never talk about in the rest of my life um as a happy as healthy as i am i feel in every fortune and as happy and healthy as I feel in my very fortunate life now, seeing this person's face, hearing their voice, seeing their name is still very triggering. Maybe it always will be. I don't know. But I just ask that you please try to understand. This is not funny, Joe, to keep sending me things related to this person. Please stop. Please try to understand. Thank you. So, again, man, like, I'm just shocked that this is not gained any traction. Like, again, I don't want the guy to be cancelled. I don't want anyone to be cancelled. Just considering what's happened in general with other comedians and in public and normal life, um, either, it's, either the fact that he's not that famous and no one gives a shit, or it's the fact that she's been very vague about what actually happened because, you know, you could, in his defense, you could just say that just sounds like him being a crappy boyfriend. Right, and if that's the case, is it a crime to be a shit boyfriend? Probably not. Um, is it advent? Is it? Is it? Um, does it make you look good? Obviously, it doesn't. But it's not something that you should be cancelled for. It's not something you should probably lose your job for. But it does throw up some interesting um questions as to maybe how people like Chris Lee or Brian Callen should have dealt with their accusations. Maybe if they kind of kept quiet and sort of stayed somewhat professional about the issue, and maybe tried to reconcile. Rec uh, rectify it you know especially in brian's case try to resolve it uh behind the scenes without doing this whole weird song and dance and show of um standing up against the mob that may have maybe lent to a far better um outcome or it's just maybe they were unlucky and they were the sacrificial lambs at the beginning of this whole ordeal and now a few years a few months on especially during a pandemic year especially within us being you know a whole 10 months maybe approaching a year living under restrictions no one really gives a shit 
And that is the unfortunate scary part of it. If you're an actual victim that's been abused or you've gone through what this lady has actually gone through, like you've now won, you've now gained the courage to talk about your experience um, and you've sort of uh, kind of lashed upon this opportunity with, you know, Andrew Schultz going through what he's going through um, with his press run for his new special on Netflix. You sort of seize an opportunity to sort of shine the light on your trauma. But effectively, people are basically telling you that, look, we don't necessarily care what you're going through. We have bigger problems to sort of address at the moment, uh, which, again, can't be blamed, but god damn it man what a scary place to live in isn't it where you can hold on to such pain for so long decide to finally air it out and in the public to say nah we're kind of over it but i don't know is this a cautionary tale for other comedians should they be maybe looking at this approach of andrew Schultz just you know deciding to be mum about it and not commenting on it whatsoever or is this one of those messy things that you just can't really judge fairly, right? It just sounds like a messy, crappy relationship that they both went through. Maybe it was probably the first serious one. Let's say it was the first serious relationship they've both been in. They were both clumsy in how they dealt with things. Um, people brought their own baggage with them in a relationship and tried to sort it out um, in real time, living with somebody else, going through whatever career trajectory they were going through. Especially, I can imagine for a man how weird it must be living with somebody that is far more successful than you in the entertainment industry because i'm sure she's a successful singer so at that time she might have been doing really really well for herself and he was so struggling as a comedic act like all these things can add to it and make it a bit messy so it might not be as black and white as it's being made out to be but it's just interesting from just a victim uh, point of view that it seems like no one has gave has given a shit about her story whatsoever from the minute that it had been published and it's been very surprising considering that I've seen a couple of blue check marks journalists on Twitter trying their best to sort of shine light on the fact that they think um, Andrew Schultz is like a right wing grifter or like a um, radicalized, uh, I don't know, conservative comedian, whatever they kind of brand these people as. So you would just assume that they would use the opportunity to kind of piggyback off the back of this and use it as, a, as another stick to kind of beam over the head with. But it hasn't worked. And I don't know why. I really don't know. Maybe the story is fluff. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. What do you guys think? Do you think Andrew's guilty? Do you think this Sarah Phillips woman is opportunistic? Um, do you think the industry is hypocritical? Um let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to know your opinions. Anyway, that's the next thing. Show episode number one. No, four one six. I always say one. I'm way past the ones, man. I'm over the ones. Over the hill, the ones. Episode number <laughs> four one six. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If you're listening via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. That'd be more than um, grateful for that. And of course, share it with all your family and friends. That would also mean the world to me. And if I don't see you guys before the end of the year, or actually I will see you before the end of the year. I plan on releasing a special New Year's Eve DJ mix on my YouTube channel so make sure you check out that it's going to play for about four hours or so over the new year period so you can listen 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 to a few of my beats and the stuff that i have to play to welcome in the new year so definitely keep an eye out for that that's coming to you very very soon but until then take care be safe and i'll see you guys again very very soon peace